Want to put it full screen or? Ah, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Sorry, I was just oh, with this microphone. No. Start. Now, where is the start? Start. Oh, so now I know. Okay. Uh, yeah. So hi, everybody. Um, so yeah. Okay. This slide is, uh, has already been <laughs> basically uh, uh, gone through. Uh, so um, so this is another talk about uh, uh, automatic differentiation. I mean, and the uh, uh, the idea of um, being able to uh, uh, take derivatives of uh, functions specified by uh, computer programs. Okay. Uh, so this uh, automatic differentiation is, a, is, a, is, a, is an old uh, field, okay? It exists, you know, since at least, uh, you know, the, the, the 70s. And uh, uh, so traditionally, uh, what uh, people do is that they consider um, things like these that we can call uh, straight line programs. So uh, basically sequences of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, variable assignments, okay? With the first order functions, okay? And uh, uh, this obviously, so it's something much less complicated you know, than the language that, uh, that Gordon introduced uh, before. And uh, uh, of course, this has a, has a very uh, natural, you know, trivially and natural uh, semantics. Okay, it gives you a function from you know a power of the real numbers to some other power of the real numbers. And so, you know, the the basic question of uh, of uh, automatic differentiation is efficiently uh, compute the Jacobian of such functions. Okay. And uh, uh, so there are several methods. And in the case in which uh, there's, a, there's a ton of inputs and just one output, okay, the, uh, the method, uh, the most efficient method, uh, is the one that's called uh, reverse mode um, uh, AD, I mean, automatic differentiation. Um, and it's, so it's the one that it's uh, the, the most important in, uh, in machine learning because, you know, I mean, especially in deep learning, because in, uh, of course, in neural networks, it, you're precisely in that situation, okay? You have millions, tens of millions, maybe billions, okay, of, of learning parameters, the weights of the network, okay, which are the input of your, of your error function, and then just one output, which is the error, okay, that you want to minimize. So, you know, so you want to compute uh, a gradient, and, and you do it with this method, you know, that's called uh, reverse mode, but, you know, more uh, quickly, just backpropagation. And uh, um, so this has been a staple of uh, deep learning since the, the 80s. So the way this is usually presented is, uh, I mean, one way of presenting it, uh, very common, is, is by uh, some means of a program transformation. So you have, um, you see uh, a straight line program like this as a graph, okay, people call it a computational graph. So this graph here corresponds, this blue graph corresponds to that program, okay. And, uh, and then what you do, so you have this transformation that takes a graph like this and it gives you a bigger graph, okay, the graph that also includes this red uh, part here, okay. And, and this big graph has two uh, fundamental properties. The first one is that the red part is, uh, the size of the red part is linear in the size of the, uh, of the blue part. Okay, so it's small. And the second part is that it has, you know, this magical property that if you put here in the, in the you know, in the blue inputs, the point on which you want to compute the gradient, and you put a one in this new uh, red uh, input here, and you just do the computation, okay. Uh, at the end, in those two uh, red outputs, you will get the gradient, okay? So, you know, even if you have 10 million inputs here, okay, you will get in just one pass all the 10 million uh, derivatives, okay, the components that form the gradient, okay? So, in, in, in contrast with other methods which have to compute the gradient, you know, um, uh, component by component, so this saves you uh, a lot of time, okay? So, that's uh, AD in one slide. Um, now, uh, more recently, uh, people have started to uh, consider, um, I mean, to specify neural networks by means of uh, programs that are more complex than just straight line programs. So, first of all, everybody agrees that a neural network is a special case of a straight line program, okay? That's, um, but, you know, you can imagine, okay, that you can, uh, uh, you know, have a more, much more complex program, okay, that uh, reduces to a, to a straight line program, so to a neural network. Um, according to some parameters, okay, that you give it uh, to uh, as input, okay. So you know, so it's a much more complex program, okay. It's, it's interface in the end is always real numbers to real numbers, so you know, it always makes sense to compute the gradient of this program because it specifies a function. But internally, it can be much more complex than a straight line program, okay. Uh, so of course, people you know want to do this, and in fact, they do this all the time. And uh, but you know, the, the, the PL community now is interested in trying to you know study these, these transformations, you know, and understand them. At, you know, at higher level, and that, that, you know, what they are understood, what they are, I mean, practically implemented, you know, in, in, 
uh, as of today. Uh, so there is uh, actually the, the very first paper that, uh, uh, that does something like this is a paper by uh, Perlmutter and, and Siskind uh, from now, it's, it's uh, 12 years ago. Um, and so it's, it's actually very different conceptually from what then people have been doing more recently, okay? When the interest in all these things, you know, has, uh, you know, has uh, sort of uh, bloomed, you know, and, and, and uh, boom, sorry. And uh, um, they do something different. It's, it's, uh, so as I presented to you, this transformation is something ex external to the program. So, you know, you have a, a programming input and a programming output of the transformation, and transformation is external, okay? What they want to do here is to actually have the program uh, apply AD uh, to like pieces of itself, okay? So it's it's more in the spirit of what uh, uh, Gordon Plotkin said in you know in his talk, and uh, um, so it's it's different, okay? It's very different, and it's difficult to compare, you know, what what people have been doing more recently in this in this kind of you know analysis of the transformation, of as an external transformation. So uh, other papers, so I, I will mention just two papers that have been you know influential for us. The first one is this paper, uh, uh, ICFP 2018 by uh, Connell Elliott. Um, I think it's the first one who uh, underlined you know, the importance of uh, compositionality you know, as the essence of uh, automatic differentiation, uh, so to see uh, AD as a functor. And, uh, and the second one is the one that's actually uh, has been the, 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 the one to which we, we owe the most, is this paper that uh, was around for uh, maybe a couple of years, but uh, it came out only very recently in ICFP uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2019. And uh, uh, so this paper by Wang uh, et al. Um, so it gives uh, a compositional uh, implementation of backpropagation using references and uh, delimited continuations. And, uh, uh, but the, the, actually the most important point for, for us is that it made us understand something that we, we had missed. That, uh, so you know, if, you, if you take you know, the situation that we have, so you know, we have a program, you know, okay, the interface is first order, but the program itself inside uh, has you know, a ton of, you know, I don't know, applications, lambdas everywhere, maps, folds, okay, it has you know, higher order inside. Okay. So you might think that in order to compute the derivative of this, okay, of this complex thing, you have to somehow be able to, uh, you know, at least I don't know, know what it means or anyway compute the derivative at higher types. Okay, what it means to compute, you know, not just the derivative of something of type R to R, but you know, of a higher type. Okay, and uh, in fact, the surprise, okay, something that we hadn't, uh, we had started, you know, doing this with the, the differential lambda calculus in mind. Okay, I don't know if you've heard of it, but you know, that's. Uh, that's a, a, a calculus that has the, the ability of doing this, okay, of doing uh, derivatives of arbitrarily, you know, higher order types. And so we started doing that, and you know, and this paper is, the, is where we understood that actually wasn't necessary, and in fact, it w we should not do that, okay, to do backpropagation efficiently. Uh, so what's lacking from all this uh, previous work? Well, the most important thing is uh, proofs. Okay, there are no soundness proofs. Okay. And uh, also, there is no uh, proof of complexity uh, of a complexity bound. Okay? I mean, the most important aspect of backpropagation is efficiency. Okay? So, how do we know that you know when we do this, you know, these more these kinds of backpropagation on, on you know these uh, I mean, these transformations on uh, these higher order programs? Okay, that we get the, the same efficiency that we get with uh, straight line programs. Okay. And, uh, and the most important thing of all, probably, that was missing is the, uh, and it's the one that actually is the key to, you know, giving the proof of these, these two uh, things, is that uh, really what, you know, what Wang et al. do, really, it's, uh, they give uh, a very nice, very elegant, uh, perhaps, implementation, okay, of uh, backpropagation in, uh, in a functional languages with references and, and delimited continuations. They do not really provide the logical, you know, we, they do not unveil the logical structure of backpropagation. Okay, so this is, in this work, I think we, we really get, you know, to the, to, you know, the logical understanding of backpropagation. And, you know, in doing this, we also give a much simpler uh, transformation. Okay, so that I'm going to describe now without falling, hopefully. Okay. Um, so here it is. This is the, the key, uh, I guess, technical slide. Um, so how do you uh, do, so I told you, right, the, 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 the key is uh, to be able to, um, to uh, make the derivative compositional, okay, the derivative uh, has to be a functor, okay, which it, it is not, okay, the derivative is not functorial, okay, the, you know, the chain rule tells you the derivative itself is not a functor, okay, so you have to make it into a functor. And, uh, um, so if you look at, uh, let me just maybe explain this bit by going back a little bit. If you look at this, you know, what backpropagation does, okay, you will see that, uh, so this part here, at the end of the graph, okay, if you see, look at this one and this negative one, okay, 
well, they actually come from this minus, okay? They are the derivative of this minus here, okay? So you see that what is at the beginning in the program, in the blue part, comes to at the end in the red part. So the red part mirrors the blue part, okay? Which means that actually in the, uh, I mean, of course, people who know this, they know, they know very, very well the people who know bad propagation, but uh, so if you don't know, what this means is that there is, you see, the red part is contravariant, okay? And the, well, the blue part is, is covariant, okay? And so what is the quintessential uh, contravariant logical connective? Negation, yes. And, um, and so, you know, our idea was just, you know, just start from scratch, just take negation, okay, and, and you know, and, and think about this, okay. And, uh, and there is a very natural canonical way, okay, of, of uh, writing uh, uh, the gradient compositionally using negation, okay, and it's that one, okay. So you get, um, instead of, you know, you, you take your function from r to the power of n to r, okay, and you transform it into a function that takes pairs, of a real number plus something that's called the back propagator, okay, which is of type, uh, you know, negation of R, and uh, and it gives a pair, okay, of again a real number and another back propagator, okay, which contains, you know, the derivative. And now it's completely straightforward to uh, prove that this thing is compositional, okay. So if you have f and g and you compute, you know, the, this transformation is the same thing as taking f, transforming it, taking g, transforming it, and then plugging the two things back together. And of course, from this, by uh, instantiating the back propagators with uh, injections and doing some projections and applying this one, you get the gradient. By the way, this one here is the is the one that I told you you had to put here in this thing. Okay, it's the same. It comes from there. And uh, so this gives uh, back propagation for straight line programs. Okay. And notice this is very nice. It's very important that in order to do it compositionally. Um, you need to introduce higher order. You see, we have applications and lambdas, even though the source code is just a straight line program. Okay, so it, when you apply this transformation, even if you start with a first order program, it already gives you a lambda term. Okay, it's very uh, interesting. This. And actually, this was already known to Permutter and Siskind, but they, they didn't use it. They just, in, in fact, we didn't know that we, we, uh, we discovered it independently, then we realized that they mentioned it at some point in the paper. It's buried somewhere because they don't use it in the end. Okay, they do something else because, you know, for what they do, they, they don't need this. And in fact, they didn't remark, okay, something that's very important, that in fact, this straightforwardly lifts to the, um, uh, to the full lambda calculus, okay? And this is what we learned by, by looking you know, at what Wang et al. did, actually, okay? They, 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 they don't really, uh, like, point this out, but actually, you know, that's what they're doing. And, uh, how much time do I have? I have five minutes, that's good. Um, so, uh, so here's the transformation in the end. So you see, on uh, ground types, it does what I told you. Okay, it's, it's uh, you know, so the ground type R is mapped to you know a pair of R and, and negation of R, uh, and on uh, first order function symbols, okay, it gives uh, this. Okay, the thing that I it's the same thing that I wrote on the previous slide. Okay, and uh, and on the rest, it does nothing. It just goes through the constructors. Okay. Uh, you see uh, the image of a variable is a variable. You just change the type. Okay? Image of lambda is lambda. Image of application is application, and so on and so forth. And this, uh, I mean, my way of understanding it is that actually when you're doing this, you're defining uh, like it's really like a two-functor from something, you know, that's just first order, okay, to, uh, you know, a two-CCC, okay, a category that is, that is a lambda calculus, okay? And since the lambda calculus, okay, with those function symbols is the free two-CCC, okay, on that something, once you have defined, okay, functor from that something to a uh, 2CCC, you, you know, you automatically get by, you know, by freeness, uh, this thing, okay? And of course, since, you know, it's an adjunction, it has to be the same thing. There is no information added between that first uh, functor that you had and this functor here, okay? So that's why it's completely trivial, okay? It doesn't add anything, okay? There's no new information. Uh, anyway, so, um, oh, in particular, notice that if you have a, a term, a program that doesn't contain uh, first order function symbols, then the image of, uh, of this term is itself. Okay, it's the, the transformation is the identity. Uh, so what, uh, uh, now what when can we prove about this? Uh, so we finally can prove all the, you know, these soundless properties that we, you know, that we were after. Um, so first, uh, let me uh, tell you, so you know, we have this kind of a square here. So what's, uh, we have, you know, this path here. What is this path? This path is what people do uh, you know, in, in practical implementation in differentiable programming, okay? Uh, they don't know, you know, they don't have this transformation that, uh, you know, applies directly on higher order uh, terms. So what they do is that they reduce the term, okay, to a straight line program, okay, in, uh, say, M steps, okay? And you know you're going to get a straight line program because your term at the, the beginning has, you know, the interface is first order, okay? So, you know, a logician would tell you, you know, by the subformula property, you know, you get 
you know, you're sure that you're going to get uh, something that doesn't contain higher order here. Okay? And then you just do back propagation the usual way. I mean, the way you've learned, you know, by, I don't know, whatever you've learned. It. And uh, so we, here we offer a different path. Okay, we offer a different route, you know, to doing this. So uh, instead of uh, reducing, okay, we just transform, okay? And then we can prove that there is this, what is, I was telling you, this true functoriality results, okay, that tells you that a reduction there maps into a reduction on the other side, okay? And the length is, uh, is linear, okay? You just add maybe a constant, so the complexity is preserved. And then you prove this conservativity result, which tells you that when you apply this transformation to a straight line program, so okay, to something you know, that you already knew what you wanted to get, you, well, you actually get what you want to get. Okay? And, uh, um, and in order to prove this conservativity, it is uh, absolutely essential, and this is, this is where you see why negation has to be linear. God, this thing is really... Ah. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, why negation has to be linear, okay, it's that... Um, in order to go from that D of G to that something that, you know, that resembles uh, <laughs> the back propagation of G, um, you need to apply this, this rule that we call this factoring rule, okay? this writing rule that is not in the usual lambda calculus, and that is wrong in general. Okay? You cannot say you know, that the sum of an application is the application to the sum. In general, this is completely wrong. Okay? The, the only reason why this is sound is because this X is linear. Okay? It's a linear function. Okay? So it's very nice that uh, um, computer science, I mean, logical linearity, Okay, comes, you know, and matches, you know, uh, I mean, ensures the mathematical linearity, okay? And this is the key to obtaining efficiency, okay? Because if you don't do this, the evaluation, I mean, you will, you will always compute the gradient, but you will do so maybe inefficiently, okay? So that's, that's very interesting, okay? That, that's why I say that, you know, the, we really have unveiled, you know, the logical structure underlying backpropagation, okay? There's something really crucial here in this thing. Then, uh, okay, yeah. So, um, this is just an example, I mean, a very trivial example, but it's, it's actually like the skeleton, you could see that the skeleton of, um, of a recurrent uh, neural network, okay, of something you know, that does uh, the fold you know, of, uh, of something you know, on, on, a, I mean, on a list. And um, so you see, when you apply the transformation, like I told you, you know, uh, higher order combinators, they don't contain first order function symbols, so they are mapped to themselves, so fold goes to fold. And then the rest, you see, goes to, uh, you see, the, uh, also the structure of data types is preserved, so, you know, the image of a list is the list of the images, so, you know, everything is really very simple. And, and in here you get immediately, I mean, you see uh, very clearly that this uh, opens uh, up all sorts of possible uh, um, optimizations uh, in the sense that, uh, uh, when you follow that route, okay, if by chance, you know, I just change this f, okay, into something else, you have to re-execute everything all over again, okay? So if this list is huge, you have to, you know, fold again this huge thing, okay, over. And, uh, and then you apply your backprop there. And that's what, by the way, that's what PyTorch does, okay? PyTorch does exactly this. It tells you to re-execute everything again. Uh, TensorFlow uh, doesn't even bother. It, TensorFlow starts here. It tells you, no, no, don't even bother giving me t. Just reduce it first and then give me g, okay? So, uh, okay, but here we see that if we change f, all we have to do is to recompute this piece here, okay? The rest stays the same, okay? And uh, so, you know, so it, it's nice, right? So I think I can stop here. I have some perspectives that I'm going to uh, go over very, very quickly. Um, so the, now the, the, the key thing is, so here this is just the simply type lambda calculus. It's very, very simple. I mean, not simply simple. It's very, I mean, you cannot say that it's a real programming language. So, you know, you would like to have fixed points to have uh, if then else, you know? And of course, you know, when, once you start doing that, uh, you get into trouble. I mean, you have all the, the problems that, uh, you know, that Gordon mentioned in his talk. And so now, you know, we're trying to extend this work, you know, to, to show that actually this transformation is sound on those points that are sufficiently far away from the, you know, from those borders, exactly, you know, what, uh, what you heard in the previous talk. And also we're trying to prove that the points on the borders, so the ones for which uh, this transformation is unsound, uh, form a, a set of measure zero. So that, you know, whenever you pick at random, you know, a point to start your initial gradient descent, the probability of picking a point on which you fail is zero. Okay. And I think I'm just going to stop here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Right, do we have some questions? I think Leonard down there. You, I, I, I thought I saw on the slide that the definition of your linear negation was R lollipop E for arbitrary E. Yes. Uh, but yes, then it looked like you were adding things of type E. Uh, no, okay, sorry. So this E in reality is going to be... Uh, so it's not it, arbitrary. It, so yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it works for arbitrary E, but then, uh, you know, in our um, context, 
it's always going to be r to the power of, uh, of sure but i mean that there is some there's actually some restriction on yes on yes e. i mean yeah i mean yeah because this is actually i mean this whole thing is parametric in the e okay so in I mean in reality it's parametric in this n okay and uh, yeah it, it depends on the rarity of your function that you want to compute the gradient of well since no one else has a question i have a, a second question <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> oh um so you said you can always reduce it to a, a uh, sort of straight line program, which uh -huh. I agree with, but that might be a really large straight line program. I yes. mean, people who are using AD for in banks, for instance, it, they can have uh, the, the program might run for an hour. So when you flatten that, it turns into a rather large uh -huh. program. Uh, what happens with your approach? Well, what happens is that uh, you don't do that. I mean, you uh, you go uh, you go directly there, okay, and then from there maybe you can. Uh, uh, okay, th this is one particular strategy that gives you, uh, you know, the soundest proof. But then maybe you can find other ways, okay, of uh, you know, other, more clever ways, okay, of computing, uh, you know, whatever it is, you know, that, uh, that that part that you need to compute, okay, without unfolding everything, okay. But then, some, in some cases, you know, if T is a compressed form of something big and uh, there is no shortcut, you know, you have to execute it in order to compute the gradient, then there is nothing. I mean, this thing doesn't add efficiency if, you know, if you are uh, forced to execute the whole thing. I mean, it's, uh... Okay, we'll take two more questions, one here and then one down in the back. Uh, so, so you mentioned about measure zero non-differentiability non and similar issue arises in probabilistic programming. Uh -huh. And then there we do some work, but I mean, it's quite the idea is very primitive, but then the, the, in our context, the idea was if you just restrict everything to analytic functions, mm -hmm. so then we can use this fact, which is the zero set of the analytic function has measure zero. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then yeah. that kind of leads some some answer, maybe not perfect. Y yes, but, but in fact, it, it is, it is uh, I mean, a key point to this thing here is that the basic, the, those function symbols, you know, the ones that you have in your language, they are an analytic. So they have the property and they for the, 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 the only way you introduce those uh, unstable points is by if then else. Okay, so then you start creating things that are not analytic anymore and you have to control this, uh, this you know, non-analyticity. Analyticity. Okay. Uh, All right, and then the final question. Yeah. Um, does this have any connections to like a smooth infinitesimal analysis? Because uh, the fact that you're defining uh, the uh, this transformation of R as R cross uh, this uh, negation of R looks an awful an awful lot like taking a tangent bundle, and I know that you can build models of smooth infinitesimal analysis uh, that are toy and therefore can interpret lambda calculus and, and a lot more. Um, where you have tangent bundles and so on, and in general, it sounds like a lot of the structure you're talking about might correspond to some of that stuff. Do you know if there's a connection there or anything? So, no, the answer is I have no idea, but okay. are you talking about a synthetic differential geometry? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the answer is, again, I have no idea, but, <laughs> but at least now I know what you're talking about. Uh, it's very interesting. It's a very good question. I, I, I've never thought about it. I mean, I know, like, the very, very surface of uh, SDG, and uh, I know what it is about, and... But I have never really asked myself this question, so I don't know. Uh, I don't know. But it's a very good question. Yeah. Uh, okay. If you have any, I mean, idea, please, you know, uh, tell me. 